strike three. Sorry. <laughs> uh, killing me, or is it killing strike three? Killing strike killing three, strike three thrilling. thrilling. Yeah. Uh, which is about queer art and HIV, and then Saturday we have a gender and performance panel, and each of those are leading into stuff that we have going on elsewhere in the festival. So uh, today, of course, is queer music and subculture, and later this week, I'm starting today with the tri documentary um, we have all sorts of stuff going on in honor of our first Legacy Awardees, Tribe 8. We have Winnie here from Tribe 8. Um, and we'll have three other members here from the band soon. Um, so again, we have the documentary going on this afternoon and then at 4 p.m. at SVT. And then tomorrow we have our award ceremony and our after-party tribute to Tribe 8. So this conference kind of is the lead-in to all of that stuff going on. And I will give it over to Paige, who is our moderator for this panel. All right, thank you so much. And I um, just want to say thanks to Corinne and PJ for creating this space and letting us invade your living room. Uh, uh, I, uh, I have three different questions that I'm hoping that we can engage with today. And the first question, I really want to function as a way for the artists to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their work. Um, but I'm going to set it up, and then, so I'm not introducing y'all before I start talking, but then I'm hoping this will kind of be an invitation for you to talk about um, your life and your, your work. Um, so this question is inspired by two different things, and it's kind of like um, music subculture and academia r rubbing up against each other in how I formulated this question. And a part I was thinking about... Um, an Austin band, uh, Power Snatch, which <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Power Snatch. <laughs> um, which if you've never seen Power Snatch, you should really just go on YouTube and spend some time. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the things um, that is amazing to me about the members of Power Snatch is that um, I was also used to be on the board of Girls Rock Camp Austin, and. Every like you could not find five people who are involved in Girls Rock Camp, um, five more involved people than Kate Messer, Terry Lord, Cindy Widener, um, and Laura Creedle. Um, and I love that like long history of involvement in queer music subculture, and especially um, kind of thinking about that in terms of Riot Girl, where a lot of the critical response to Riot Girl. Um, was like, oh, these girls are going to grow up and grow out of that, you know. Like, this is a passing, childish, <coughs> girlish phase. So I love um, this band from the 90s, like all these members still being so involved in um, music, youth music subcultures. And I love the way that really speaks back to, especially like these kind of narratives of like feminine involvement in subculture. Um, and that was just like, it's deeply meaningful to me, and you hear from the parents all the time at Rock Camp, like, I send my daughter to Rock Camp because I want them to experience artists who have had different life trajectories than me. Like, I want them to see that you can organize your life lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to put that against um, some ideas from queer theory, and specifically here I'm thinking about um, this book that I love, In a Queer Time and Place, by Jack Halberstam. Um, and in that book, uh, Jack makes this argument that essentially one of the things that makes queer people queer is not so much who they have sex with, but how they organize their lives around, and specifically how they organize time and space. And that if there's like a heteronormative narrative about subculture, it's like, oh, subculture is something you do when you're a kid. Um, and then you either learn how to make money from it, or you abandon it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, but for queer people, um, one of the like one of the kind of pieces of our queerness is possibly a kind of lifelong not growing up, not <laughs> retreating to the private sphere, but kind of staying connected to our to our subcultures. Um, so I wanted to just invite the artists to kind of talk about their relationship to music subcultures, and I don't want to impose this like heteronormative narrative of like. <laughs> what did you do in your youth, and what do you do now? <laughs> but just to kind of talk about maybe, like, what has queer music subculture meant to you, what has music subculture meant to you mm. at different points in your lifespan, mm -hmm. um, at different points in your life. Um, so, uh, Lenny, will you start? 
I was just trying to like re, uh, repeat to myself that last bit. What does queer music subculture and what like, else mean? Like how has, how have you been involved in it? Like how has it been kind of part of your life across your lifespan? So is it part of that typical narrative? Like it's something you do when you're young and then you either make money from it or grow out of it? Or is it something that's been meaningful across years and decades? Right. Um, Hi, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Yay. <laughs> uh, I'm Lenny, uh, and I'm the singer for Tribe 8, or I was. I um, guess I always will be. The yeller, anyway. I'm just a singer. But, um, but I'd say that queer music's been a part of my life in that, in the 70s, when I was growing up in San Leandro, California. Uh, my, all my closest friends were Mexican fags. And we would go around school every day, and we would try to pick out other, which I'm sure you can't say fags anymore, but we did at the time, because we were reclaiming that shit, uh, <laughs> gay male homosexuals, and then we would come back and meet, and meet, and meet in the fucking quad or somewhere, and go, did you find any? Yes, I did. He has an earring, and he's from Brazil, and he's going to get him, just <laughs> hang out on the gay lawn. And then we had two uh, gay hangout areas in 1975. One was like the rockers, and the other one was the disco queers. Mm -hmm. And the disco queers, they sat mm -hmm. in the fucking smoking section. And there was like, they had cement ashtrays built into the fucking lunch tables, and they had, uh, mm -hmm. they wore a lot of polyester, and we wore like fucking overalls. We had Marlboros in the pocket, and they smoked menthols. Right. And there was a lot of differences. <laughs> <laughs> and stealing girlfriends and boyfriends back and forth. And people would cross the lines. It was very, but nobody cared that we were queers. That was cool. But one of the things that we really met on was music. Like, some of us would sit around and listen to Queen. And it was pointed out to me that actually the singer was gay. And I was like, no. That's impossible. Because he's famous and he's obviously mm. successful and very good. So how could he be gay? And Chester, my pal, was like, no, dude, no, look. You know, and of course later I would look and go, like, he's. Clearly a Castro clone, right. but but nobody knew. Straight people didn't know. Gay people didn't know either. And so um, you know, I'm gonna keep singing "Killer Queen" and all this shit. You know, all the lyrics in there are just so obviously queer. But I didn't know. I was like, wow. But we loved it. We loved Day at the Races. We loved you know Night of the Opera and then uh, all the other things that we listened to. We queered because we we looked at it and heard it through a gay lens. A queer lens, and then we, I would borrow my dad's car and pile all the bags in the car. Oh, sorry, gay male homosexuals. And then we'd go to the end up, which was a, a bar in San Francisco, it was a disco, and they would play Sylvester. Mm. Now, Sylvester was the first out trans queer person of color, like all these things, <coughs> but like queer on the fucking radio and being played through those speakers while we were on the dance floor because we were listening to all the other people that were like on the radio that more straight people that were very happy to have our money, but um, I don't know they necessarily loved us. You know, I went to a couple of shows where, like, I went to go get their autograph later. I'm not going to mention names, but I'd say they were kind of shitty. They were like, next, fucking dyke. That was their attitude, you know? And so when we heard that person say ho, 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 us, ho, ho, ho. Name names. Sylvester. Oh, the other, the no, other, the, the names of the people yeah, that were kind yeah. of, that was just my opinion, I don't know. That's right. And Speckus Bitch is here, oh my God, what's up? Hey, yeah. mama. But anyway, I'm just saying that we, we, we connected through Sylvester first and Queen. And then, you know, in the 90s, I mean in the 80s, I like kind of checked out and did a lot of speed, so then I was into Black Flag. And then I was like, I really tried to be like Henry Rollins, and then when I got clean, I was like, how am I going to be like Henry Rollins and be me at the same time? And that's when we started Tribe 8. And we were just like, we're just going to incorporate all the things, like all the different backgrounds that we had. You know, there was world beat, there was like metal, like just regular rock and roll in the 70s, Silas. Uh, Tantrum was like world beat, bass player, uh, and so was Mahia. And Leslie had been in an all-check punk band in uh, Colorado. And we just brought all that shit 
and we filtered it through our lives and our experiences, and when we came together and we just played that, it was some weird mixture of shit that no one ever heard before, <laughs> but mm -hmm. that's where we met, and I feel like that's what I want to do, is like incorporate my own experiences, listen to what other people's experiences are, and like have them somehow like fluidly fit together, and it's going to be awkward at times, and it's going to be ugly, and it's going to be noisy, um, and some people are going to be offended, and you know what? It's, but it's us, and so the one of the beautiful things about collaborating in art and music that way for me was having family, which means that in a family, people are going to be pissed at you sometimes, but it's okay, because they're going to keep listening, they're going to keep coming back, and they're going to try to like incorporate you into their lives. So, mm. I'd say that. <laughs> that would be my answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll riff on a little bit, like your sort of how you sort of. Uh, I'm John Z, I'm a visual artist and filmmaker. I live in Los Angeles. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia in a really rural area and didn't come out actually until I went to art school. So when I started going to art school, um, things sort of just started coming together as far as what I was into. Um, and I started leaving Philadelphia and going up to New York to the Pyramid Club. and. Seeing, yeah, and seeing like a lot of uh, like early Sonic Youth and Babes in Toyland, and those were the kind of things that like when I when I experienced those, I was like, this really deeply resonated with me. There was something about the 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 women that I just really kind of took to, as far as like I wanted to share my um, experience that was very similar um, to the anger that they were feeling and just the 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 the, the songs and how. They were, you know, how they how they did things. So, um, I had a really good friend in art school who dated my best friend Tammy Ray Carland, and she kind of really got me involved with people who um, were queer and were just like starting to make music. And it was it was very new. It, like there wasn't a lot of um, people in the past that you could look to that were doing. Um, like kind of take t uh, turning this into something. So she kind of introduced me to um, Kathleen, who was in, you know starting Bikini Kill in D.C. I was still in Philadelphia, and so Fag Batch before I was in it was this this guy Paul Bonomo, and who's now Snacks and who lives in Berlin. <laughs> um, he started it with a friend of his, and I saw like a really early show of Bikini Kill and an early incarnation of Fag Bash at DC Space and didn't realize that like, years, years later when I moved to San Francisco that um, I would actually join Fag Bash. So, <laughs> um, I joined Fag Bash years later, uh, two, two or I guess two or three years later, and I played bass and definitely like my, my connection to, to music was always through the visual and being a visual artist. And um, that's still, I mean, to, in going past that, I mean, I was only in Fact Bash for a couple of years, and then I kind of played music and did a lot of musical projects, but it informed my aesthetic in a way that's continued to this day. And uh, there's, there's always something deeply, um, that I deeply connect to about how things were made and how we did things that I still continue to this day in my own work. Um, <coughs> So that's always been, that's a really important part of, of looking back and also looking forward with, with how that aesthetic evolves, how, how it changes over time. Um, and just, yeah, just, there was just a really, you know, um, a nice way that we did things that um, I'll, I'll always utilize in some capacity. That's sort of, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Gretchen. Hi, I'm Gretchen Phillips. But I really got to thank Corinne and PJ and Annie for making this dream come true. Uh -huh. Really, such a beautiful dream to have Austin's rich, rich, rich queer scene get to meet people and, and for us to show what we're made of because it's so strong and it's so old, yeah. you know. So I'm just very touched to get to be a part of this. Um, I. 
my parents were musicians, folk musicians, singing protest songs that were political. So singing a song about injustice, well, I just grew up with that. <laughs> and to me, um, you know, queer music uh, uh, and punk music are an extension of that kind of, I need to express my emotion musically about, about this injustice and about these politics, sexual politics, you know, whatever. I started because I started out very folky and um, also listened to Queen, absolutely, and even in, the, in Queen 1 and 2. And, 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 but I, I also was, I was very deeply disturbed by Edgar Winters' albinoness with that necklace and David Bowie and Klaus Nomi on Saturday Night Live and just that shit just really was pro a big problem for me. Big problem for me. I, and I, it made me extremely uncomfortable. Um, and I was teased tremendously when I was a kid. I mean, I just was called a boy and, and, um, and I'm from Texas and shit is very gendered here. Mm -hmm. You know, extremely mm -hmm. so. And my, my relatives were terrified that I was going to turn out gay when I didn't even know what that meant. You know, I just wanted some fucking male privilege, excuse me. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I'm not that horny right now, I just want some male privilege. But, uh, <laughs> but, but my world really changed with, um, and Lenny and I were talking about this last night, 1975, Janice Ian in a white suit. Mm all over television with at 17, mm. just registering as so gay. And I, I fucking, all of a sudden I wanted to do that. I wanted to be able to affect people musically. I wanted to, I dreamt that I could say something that stuck inside of people's minds, a song, a melody, a hook that would stay in there unbidden where they wouldn't even want to be singing my lesbian manifesto, <laughs> but that it was so melodically worried that they had to. <laughs> and I just, I had a mission. And I was very, very fortunate to go to a performing arts high school where I was uh, pretty much an out lesbian before there was any stray gate alliances or help from administration for mm. lesbians all sleeping with each other. Mm -hmm. There was none. Um, and then I moved here and the punk scene here in 81 was dominated by fags. Mm -hmm. The kings of the scene were Biscuit and the Big Boys, mm -hmm. Gary Floyd and the Dicks, um, uh, David Dichter and MDC, and um, Chris Wing and Jerry's Kids. Um, and there were, then there were these offshoots with, 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 with women, with um, Whom Elements and in uh, Houston, My Dolls, and there was cr incredible cross-pollination uh, that took place with all these bands and, and to to move from Houston to Austin and just have there be all of these these queers, I just was like, oh, okay, look how easy it is. If you don't fear assassination, it's just like you know you know, and so you know, music is music is an is very much an emotional part of my life. It's very, very my feelings are very much tied in with it. But it, it I think of it as propaganda. I very much think of it as propaganda. I've done a lot of um, studies of gospel um, and you know sacred work in terms of how, again how these how these um, transgressive and controversial and maybe ideas that don't sit well inside of one can be uh, come through the body, come through the ear, come through the driving, and you're humming something. Um, that 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 to me is um, a very important part of music, you know. And um, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Next, um, I'm Max. Um, I'm in a local band here called Magna Carta, hip hop band. And um, I guess I don't can't go too far back. <laughs> 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 My story starts in the 90s. Uh, I guess growing up there wasn't really, or I would say I w there wasn't too much to look up to in the queer community 
or the LGBT community. And so I was looking up to the women in hip hop and rap. And in the 90s, it was TLC, MC Light, and they have their like baggy jeans and like baggy jerseys. And so I could relate to that because I grew up a tomboy. And I'm like, oh, I can't be a rapper or I can't be a musician or an entertainer if I'm not this, if I'm not that. But then I can see these girls and, you know, they're not lesbians, but I can identify with them because they look how I look and they're talking about social injustices. Um, just like I wanted to talk about. And then um, I guess as I got older, I started to, I grew up in New Orleans, so as I got older, uh, the bounce music scene was like huge and just dominated by gay men. So looking at that, I guess I I figured, well, they're, they're out, they're proud, they're singing about, you know, whatever, rapping about whatever, and um, it was always a party with them. and. Uh, I guess looking at that and being able to see that, I felt that I could do it too, but, you know, in the real world, I started looking at, you know, other models and seeing that maybe, you know, it's slightly different, maybe I got a longer road ahead of me, mm -hmm. and so I moved here to Austin for college, and I, um, uh, everybody says it, like, when you, when you get into college and you start learning so much, you know, your whole mind frame kind of changes and I was just like, oh, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Like, I'm going to wear the baggy clothes or I'm going to wear the backwards hat. Um, I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. And then it's easy in rap and hip hop because uh, where that started was with a lot of um, social injustice. It's like pretty much the same thing, just a different, you know.